good evening and uh, good morning, Professor Rivel. Um, it is my uh, deepest pleasure and honor to uh, have you as the speaker of this uh, conference and uh, have this opportunity to discuss with you on the legal AI. Uh, let me briefly introduce Professor Grebel to the audience. Professor Grebel is currently professor of computing science in the Department of Computing Science at the University of Alberta and he graduated uh, from Regina, Alberta, and got his PhD uh, of computer science from British Columbia University. Uh, he is a world-renowned uh, expert on abduction, hypothetical reasoning, and belief revision, and most of all, uh, explainable AI in applications in legal and medical reasoning. Uh, he'll uh, talk, share uh, with us uh, his insights on the legal reasoning, legal AI, and uh, related issues. Please welcome him with a uh, warm applause. Uh, first, let me thank uh, the Asian Leadership Conference and uh, Chosun Ilbo for the invitation to participate. Um, a special thanks to Nikki, uh, Gawan Kim, and Han Aro for their investment of time, especially so late in the evening in Seoul. It's very early in the morning for me in the mountain time zone um, in Alberta, so uh, we are spending 15 hours of time zones. The one way to keep uh, attention laid out um, is to have a little controversy. And I just listened to Minister Huan talk um, at length about all of the uh, tools and organizations being developed um, to manage the identification of criminals. And it may, well, it may, may be a language uh, challenge, is he re repeatedly referred to um, criminals I mean, in one case, he referred to using robots to interrogate criminals. Um, I want to try to give you a, a perspective as quickly as I can about the difference between that gray area of determining whether someone is a criminal or not, according to the judicial systems and the jurisdictions of interest, versus the use of the adjective interrogating criminal, which presumes someone is already a criminal, in which case the interrogation isn't so useful. Uh, but let me see that controversy and, and now proceed. I come from the uh, uh, Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, um, and that institute was started at the turn of the last century in about the year 2000 by me and, uh, and uh, two, uh, three other colleagues, two of whom have since retired, uh, but the two remaining have built what is uh, acknowledged in Canada and around the world as one of the top three scientific production AI institutes. You may know that Canadian AI uh, investment and the Pan-Canadian AI uh, program has identified three groups in Canada to do AI. Vector in Toronto, Mila in Montreal, and Amy in Edmonton. Um, we rank number three in scientific output in the world next to Carnegie Mellon and Tsinghua University, which many of you will know in Asia has been accelerated by massive investment by the, the Chinese. Now, the lab that I run inside of Amy is called the Explainable AI Lab, as Dr. Han mentioned. And the, the motivation comes from years of technical formal philosophy in building causal models which can provide the basis for explanation of AI machine learning predictions. And I'll say a little bit more about that as we go. Because we are, our time is short, I want you to use um, an analogy by explaining what we do in our lab. So our theoretical work in the development of AI methods is tested by application in two high impact areas, legal reasoning 
and me medical reasoning. And I want you to understand that the issues faced and the infrastructure being developed in both health and legal reasoning are very closely uh, aligned. Uh, so, for example, let me give you a phrase from the Canadian Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, which says the following, is that AI will not replace doctors. Doctors who do not use AI will be replaced. And so to Minister Wang's point is that prosecutors, lawyers, and judges um, will not be replaced by AI, but those that do not use AI will be replaced. And you'll see why as I talk about the challenge, the promise, the danger, and adoption of AI. Next slide, please. One of the primary motivations for the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in any part of society is to advance and expedite the more accurate and more um, rapid decision support. This is true in both health and in legal reasoning. So let me give you an idea about that challenge and what to do. Next slide, please. The important part of this slide is not the fine print, but um, it, this is an example in my jurisdiction in Canada where our Supreme Court decided there should be a time limitation on cases. And if the time limitation is not met, you'll see at the bottom in red, the total delay between charges and conclusion of the trial <clears throat> must be concluded within 49.5 months. This, this, to a computer scientist, seems like a very dangerous precedent because what it does is it says that the content and the semantics of cases considered by prosecutors, judges, uh, and uh, defending lawyers is time-dependent, not content-dependent. And that's simply unacceptable. Next slide, please. Um, the sad cases as of 2019, note that it takes a while for, um, for cases to be documented, but by this time, 800 criminal cases were thrown out over delays. So this is a photo of, a, of two parents of a child who was murdered, um, and they suffer the cost of inefficient judicial systems. Um, there can be many things spoken of here, but this is the... This is the motivation, I think one motivation for applying AI and machine learning to judicial reasoning. Next slide, please. So let me give you a glimpse of what artificial intelligence can provide with respect to legal reasoning. Um, the, the most important thing to understand is there will never be an AI and machine learning system that doesn't make mistakes. That will not happen. Find whoever you want that are AI experts around the world um, and they won't be able to actually um, challenge that statement. So what is the promise? Let me give you an example about the complexity of what AI systems can currently do and let you judge for yourself. So next slide, please. <clears throat> about eight years ago, one of the colleagues I've worked closely with in Japan, um, uh, currently at the National Institute of Informatics, whose name is Ken Sato, he and I had been working on formal reasoning for a long time, and he decided that one of the primary applications of such formal reasoning would be, would be legal reasoning, not medical reasoning, but legal reasoning. To my great surprise, my colleague Ken Sato actually took a law degree at the University of Tokyo while being a full-time professor to be able to understand uh, the challenge of applying AI to legal reasoning. And together with the teammates you see on this slide, we started the competition on legal information extraction and entailment, who just completed its eighth year of competitions. The, the point was to build a community that 
challenged the best AI methods to make progress on some automated legal reasoning. Now, let me give you the, a sketch of the two of the two uh, challenge cases, problems that we uh, looked at. Next slide, please. Um, here's an example translated from Japanese into English of statute law challenge. So we took uh, exam questions from the Japanese bar law exams. We have them translated to both English and Korean because one of our team members is Korean. Um, and here's the example of a statute and a yes, no question um, that I certainly can't answer. If the audience includes people who have studied Japanese statute law or find similarities to the use of language, in this case, English, one might be able to answer this question. You'll see it's uniquely about a Japanese context considering uh, damage to a luxury kimono. Now the answer to this yes, no question um, the answer is yes, the rescuer does not have to compensate damages for the kimono. I am not confident as a legal reasoner to give this answer, but we have built systems through the history of these competitions that can answer 70% of these questions correctly. That means in the cases that are aligned in front of a particular judge, um, identification of statutes and the use of these systems can provide some guidance for a decision. Noting that in this case, it's still the case that our understanding of natural language is very weak. And so we can't guarantee accuracy. We can only say we can achieve 70%. Next slide, please. Um, uh, in the change from continental or statute law to case law, the competition includes the, the use of methods that identify notice cases amongst the background of cases. In this case, we've curated um, some 400,000 cases in a database to be able to be used in the competition. In this, in, in this situation, Canadian case law is actually one of the easiest and best curated case law databases in the world, so we use that. So we have similarly systems that will be accurate to about 70% in identifying the appropriate noticed cases, which of course are used by lawyers to formulate um, threads of defense reasoning to present before a judge to create a decision. So that's to give you an idea about what, uh, what AI natural language processing can currently do is you can just mm, abstractly think of this as us being able to do about 70% accurate reasoning on existing databases, which should clearly inform you that these are tools in support of human decision making, just like in medicine, they are not tools to replace human decision making. You'll see some comments on that in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So now the danger of inappropriate application was something that emerged implicitly from Minister Huang's um, passion for the international network and data exchange. Uh, and and uh, as an AI person, I am particularly nervous and concerned about the inappropriate application of AI, some of which was hinted at in Minister Huang's presentation. Next slide, please. Um, the predictions of reoffending that Minister Huang spoke about are, are uh, uh, um, what I would say, common application of AI, especially in the U.S. And if you think about the 70% accuracy, you can imagine that the systems being used are, are keeping people and sending people to jail and getting, the, getting it wrong. Now, I know the, the history of Korea has a fondness for the United States of America. Uh, Canadians are more skeptical. So next... Uh, component of the slide will give you an idea. 
you may not have known is that the U.S. imprisons more people than any jurisdiction on the planet. That is, is as you see here, one in 38 American adults are under some form of correctional supervision. That's the highest in the world. That's higher than China. That's higher than Korea. That's higher than India. All of these places who have enormous populations. So it's pretty serious to deploy AI, which doesn't get it right. Next slide, please. This is a well-documented case where a private company um, contracted to provide proprietary AI mechanism to the penal system. Um, this example comes from Florida. Note, note that many of the American penal systems are privately operated. Um, and here, the prediction based on attributes of individuals is used to, is to predict whether they will reoffend. Um, uh, next slide, please. In this case, these particular individuals were uh, received scores of three and ten, where Bernard Parker was predicted to reoffend with higher risk than than Dylan Fugit. This was proved to be wrong, and in fact, Bernard Parker studied enough AI to figure out why the compass system was wrong. This is a, one of the a famous cases in the U.S. that many American journalists have have used to demonstrate the danger of applying AI. There's two dangers here. One is that AI can never be right. It can only be suggestive and supportive and help improve the accuracy of decisions. And it will never be right, as I've said. So there's a great danger here. So that's something you can study. Now the next slide, please. Um, yeah, we can skip this. This is just more documentation on what happened here. I want to say a little bit about the adoption of AI methods. So next slide. Um, um, I've worked um, uh, with um, Young Yek Grim, the CEO of Intellicon in Seoul, which is an example of a company that has a very broad view of how to apply AI to legal reasoning with the appropriate disposition or philosophy, that is to apply AI methods to help accelerate the management of legal informatics and data in order to support uh, de legal decision making. Uh, move forward, please, next slide. Um, so all I want to note is that Asia actually leads the adoption of AI in law. Um, and maybe the most important point we should finish with now, next slide. Um, next slide, next slide, is is um, is the moderator and someone who has had good conversations with um, Dr. Han as a former judge and a current faculty member uh, as, as a instructor in legal methods has made it clear that this quote from Joe Weissenbaum, the author of Computer Power and Human Reason and one of the earliest AI programs using natural language um, is appropriate here. And Dr. Wang, has, Dr. Han has pre prepared several questions that show deep insight into this issue. So I'll pause and stop now. Professor Goebel, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. As you said, I, uh, we, as we have only 10 minutes now, uh, I prepared several questions uh, which uh, our audience uh, would be mostly interested in. Uh, uh, let me give you my first question. Uh, as you explained in the Jordan case, the judiciary of South Korea is also experiencing a very serious backlog pro problem. It uh, has worsened uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So the yes. Supreme Court of Korea is uh, preparing 
uh, for uh, some sort of uh, digitization and adoption of AI in the legal field. And one of the uh, Supreme Court research project is uh, to uh, develop an AI uh, that can uh, just give recommendations to judges on uh, the allocation of liability between plaintiff uh, the plaintiffs and the defendants on the car accident cases. But mm -hmm. uh, many judges I met uh, showed some sort of hesitance that uh, even if they uh, get the advice or recommendations from AI, yes. they wouldn't use yes. it if it's not explainable. Mm -hmm. So yes. could you tell us uh, that kind of explainability is achievable? Mm -hmm. And how? Okay. Um, thank you very much. You should all note that Dr. Hans' insight on these uh, requirements are, are profound and deep. So one of the things I would like to ask is to put up the slide deck again and show the last two slides. Um, and I'll address the explainability issue in that way graphically. It's probably the easiest way to start. Um, to get to get you started, consider um, in this traffic example uh, the uh, judge listening to arguments about a decision one way or the other. If that decision is based on on um, a prosecutor counting the number of similar cases and counting the number of decisions in favor versus against, that would be a very unsatisfying explanation based only on numbers. So back to the, the case law challenge, the, on, the only way to pursue that and the answer to the question, at least briefly and abstractly, next slide please, is, is we need to build representations. You'll see a very tiny change in those slides, but one of the things we do is identify the fragments in cases that are essential to the complete reasoning um, uh, sequence from beginning to end of the summary and decision, and then annotate those so that a judge and a lawyer can understand the, the essential judicial reasoning segments of each case. We require a deeper understanding of natural language than, than is currently available. So um, the natural language generation programs like GTP3 or Google Translate are woefully inefficient and incomplete, so they're not sufficient. But to the short answer to Judge Han's question is that we need to build multiple levels of representation and build systems that essentially can be interrogated. So when a judge sits in, uh, in front of a case with a plaintiff and a prosecutor, uh, the idea is that the judge uh, can always ask the AI system the questions about why it's recommending something, why it's predicting a certain outcome. And that means you need to build those systems, which mean building levels of representation that are not just as um, Judge Han indicated, the statistics of deep learning methods. Deep learning methods will not help you is another way to think about this. Thank you. Uh and uh, another following question. Uh, yeah. Even if we can make AI that can assist judges uh, with enough explanation, workable explanation, uh, it does not solve all the problems. Uh, if uh, the uh, recommendations by AI is getting uh, really uh, accurate, then the judges would be uh, dependent on it. But uh, if yes. uh, a judge uh, depend uh, on the AI recommendation too much uh, without uh, much consideration, then it will be some sort of, uh, uh, give, they are giving up their duty as a judge. Uh, and it will be the violation of the constitutional right of people uh, to be tried by a human judge. Uh, can we solve the problem? Can we deter judges from uh, relying too heavily on AI recommendations? 
another profoundly deep question. Let me answer it in a couple of ways. First, um, um, I will notice in Canada, let's use my jurisdiction, is that when I, when I go to a retail shop and I pay for something in cash and the retail clerk has to calculate to make change, most of our retail clerks rely on a calculator. They can't do the mental arithmetic of something so simple as making change anymore. That's exactly the same situation you're worried about with judges. That is, the judges may come to rely on the approximate accuracy of predictions from an AI system and spend no time or become, what you might say, become legally and intellectually lazy about those decisions, which will do two things. One is it will, it will support bad decisions and to your constitutional challenge it will put them offside of their obligation to to invest full knowledge into the decision they're being made what's the solution there are two solutions one is incrementally build systems that provide for the interaction with the with legal uh, personnel and experts, including judges, to always ask questions about why a certain prediction was made. But the second thing is to increase the, adjust the education as you saw in the, in the international uh, organization that Minister Wong spoke about, is that judges should be recertified by being given test cases to be able to understand how things that look correct under the covers with interrogation with explainable AI turn out to be incorrect. That does two things. One is it continues to test judges and certify them. And it provides information to a learning system that continually looks at errors and adjusts them. So I can't think of any other method, but it's an essential that humans be recalibrated. Just like you need to recalibrate your driver's license as you're become old and your eyes become weak, um, you need to be able to do that. So let me pause there. Yes. Now, uh, uh, time is almost over. Uh, we don't have more time. So uh, although I have two more questions, uh, our session should be finished here. Uh, thank you so much again for uh, sharing your great ideas with the audience. And uh, thanks, I, thanks to yeah. Judge Han. I'd like to call her Judge Han, not Dr. Han, because yeah. she has great insight into the challenges. I hope to continue my conversations with her yeah. in the future. Uh, thank you. And thank you uh, f uh, for your wonderful presentation and uh, discussion. Uh, uh, and good night uh, here. <laughs> good night. I hope you can all take a rest. Thanks for enduring to the end of this long, long day.